for you all. Uh, we invite everybody uh, to stay after services for class today as well. Uh, I want to highlight something real quick <clears throat> that we're doing on Wednesday. Uh, it certainly deserves announcing. Uh, of course, Wednesday night we're back to serving our fellowship meal at 6 o'clock and then everybody stays for services and class on at 7. But also at 6 o'clock, uh, for those that can't join us in person, uh, for whatever reason, whether it be COVID or uh, sickness or Really, whatever. Uh, Dennis George is doing a Zoom class at six o'clock. Uh, they're doing a kind of a brief study and a time of prayer. Uh, so, if you can't join us on Wednesday, uh, you can certainly join J uh, Dennis online uh, at six o'clock. Uh, the link is provided uh, via email, or you can contact the church, and uh, they'll be sure and get you hooked up with that. Uh, Dennis, over the years, uh, in my opinion, has been one of the best teachers that we've had here. So. Uh, I encourage you to, to join that. I know it'll be fruitful. And uh, Dennis also has a prayer request this morning. Uh, his mother, Christine George, uh, she's in a nursing home in Alabama, and she's taken uh, a turn for the worse. So uh, we want to pray for Dennis's mother this morning, uh, Christine George. Uh, this morning, we want to congratulate uh, Michael and Danielle Wheeler uh, with the birth of Weston Wheeler, uh, Weston Michael Wheeler. Uh, we know Hazley and Maverick are excited. Uh, as our grandparents, uh, Danny and Laura. So we certainly want to congratulate them and their entire family uh, to their new addition. Uh, this morning, uh, we also want to extend our condolences uh, to Ashley, uh, Ashley Volker. Uh, Ashley's grandfather passed away. Uh, his name was Paul Kirby. Uh, so please be praying for the Kirby family and Ashley and her family. Uh, we ask for your ongoing prayers uh, for Lisa Beth Brown, uh, and Ricky Weaver, uh, both of whom are uh, taking cancer treatments right now. Uh, we certainly want to be prayerful for them. And also, I saw Tyler here this morning. Tyler Peterson's leaving for the Air Force on the 22nd. Uh, we want to be praying for him. It all goes well for him. Uh, pray for his wife, Julie, and, of course, uh, parents, uh, Keith and Jacqueline. So, Tyler, congratulations to you, young man. We're uh, certainly excited to, uh, to see you grow. Uh, we're thankful for your service as well. Uh, that's all I have this morning. Uh, as always, uh, we're certainly happy to have everybody with us uh, here at the Alton Church of Christ. Thank you once again. If you're following along in the songbook, 
Next song will be number 121. If you would, let's stand while we sing this song. 121. Come, let us all unite to sing God is love. Let heaven and earth their praises bring God is love. Let every soul from sin awake, each in his heart sweet music Upward to Zion, 
Father, we come to you today to worship your name. We praise your name. Father, we're just so thankful that you are here with us in this church. Father, we just pray that, that we worship together. We praise your name, Father, and, and uh, we just pray that you're, you're with us through this worship service. Father, we also pray that uh, the words that we hear today, whether it be your, your, holy, your holy word or, or through song or through, through prayer, Father, we just pray that, that we take these words that... We take it through our life, we take it through, through school, through our work. Father, we just, we just hope that, that these words are, are in our hearts and minds through our lives. Father, we pray for the sick. Father, sickness and death is always with us. But so are you. And we know this. We know this every day through the good, through the good days through the bad days. Father, we are, we are thankful for your son who died on the cross, willingly but, but not worthy of it. Father, we just, we just praise him and we're thankful for his, for his decision to do that. Father, we pray in your son's holy name. Amen. <coughs> Song for the lesson will be How Sweet, How Heavenly, number 709, if you follow along the book. <clears throat> if you would, let's stand when we sing this song. <clears throat> how sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord in one another's feet delight. here and hope that you've been made to feel at home. If you're joining us online this morning, we want to say welcome and glad that you're able to be with us also. If you want to open up to Exodus chapter 17, Exodus chapter 17 is where we're going to find ourselves this morning. Exodus chapter 17. Before we get into this, let's uh, go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Holy Father, we, uh, we're grateful that we can be in your presence. 
we're grateful that we can be in, in each other's presence. And we're grateful that when we gather together, you join us here in this moment and in our spirit, in your spirit, Father. Father, we are mindful of the people in our, uh, in our midst and, um, and in our family who are hurting due to various, uh, various things going on in their life. You know who they are, Father. You know what's going on. We pray that you will be in those moments and that you will grant healing and you will grant peace. Father, help us to gather around them and to be a support, to be able to lift them up, to encourage, but also to grieve with them, Father. Father, as we look at your word this morning, we pray that you will shine through, that your message will be clear, Father, that we will fall deeper in love with you, and that we can learn to follow you, uh, uh, follow you in, in bigger and, and stronger ways every day, Father. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as many of you are aware, today is uh, it's a big day in the world of professional sports. It's a, a big day, especially in, in the world of professional football. Tonight, the, the Cincinnati Bengals and, and the Los Angeles Rams will go head to head in, in the Super Bowl. And, and many people are excited about this. It's predicted that more than 100 million people will tune in tonight to see what will happen with this game. Many will tune in to see what's going on with the game. And, and many will just tune in because they want to see the commercials. And they're excited about what those will, will bring. But as a way of leading up to this event, I thought maybe what I would do this morning is I would share one of the greatest football, football moments that I ever remember seeing. It didn't happen in the Super Bowl. As a matter of fact, it didn't even happen in the NFL. However, it does involve someone who's now a part of the NFL and was a piece of last year's Super Bowl champion, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Byron Leftwich is now the offensive coordinator for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and he played 10 seasons in the NFL. He played for the, the Jaguars, he, he played for the Steelers, the Falcons, and even a little bit of time with the Buccaneers. However, before being this, this NFL quarterback, Leftwich had this storied career as one of the greatest football players to ever play for Marshall University. His senior year, he would finish sixth in the voting for the Heisman Trophy Award. And he would go on to be the seventh overall pick in, in that year's NFL draft. He was the second quarterback taken behind only Carson Palmer, who was the first overall pick. He'd won the Heisman Trophy that year, and he was selected by the Cincinnati Bengals. Many people outside of, of fans of Marshall, uh, of Marshall football probably don't remember much about Byron Leftwich. Probably don't remember a whole lot of, of his career. Many probably haven't seen very many of his highlights. However, there is one moment in his career that sports fans all over have seen. It's a highlight that, that I remember watching in the moment. It's one of the most inspiring moments that have ever been seen in any sports. It was Saturday, November 2nd, 2002. Marshall was playing at the University of Akron. And during the first quarter, Byron Leftwich went down with a leg injury. Uh, uh, one of the de defensive linemen had, had gotten through, they hit him in, uh, on his lower leg, and he went down with a leg injury. Video operators at the game would catch Leftwich being loaded into a vehicle and taken to a local hospital to get x-rays. And while there, he would find out that he'd broken his left tibia. Seeing as how Leftwich was, was due to be one of the, the top quarterbacks taken in the upcoming NFL draft, and, and knowing how these, hand, these things are handled, in college football today, you would probably assume that this was the end of Leftwich's uh, illustrious Marshall career. Leftwich would be rushed back to the game and get there in the third quarter, being helped onto the field even by a state trooper. And rather than watching the rest of the game from the sidelines in street clothes, Leftwich, broken leg and all, would enter it back into the game. He would end up throwing for over 300 yards and lead his team to a comeback attempt that would end up falling just short. However, it was in these moments that the world would witness one of the most iconic images of, in all of college football history. 
With about 11 minutes remaining in the fourth quarter, Leftwich connected with Darius Watts for about a 40-yard reception. Hardly able to walk and, and needing to, to be in a hurry because they were behind, needing to get down the field in a hurry, Byron Leftwich was picked up and carried down the field by two of his offensive linemen. I remember this scene uh, so well. I remember watching that team play. I remember seeing this moment. They were a team that cared about each other. They were a, a team that, that played not just with each other, but for each other. They, pl they played for the pride in, in their school and the pride of their team. They played for each other, and it's easy for us to rally behind a team like that. Recently, Leftwich was a hot name being considered for many of the, the open head coaching positions around the NFL. And with these discussions taking place, this image began to resurface. People have been talking again about this moment. However, what I want to point out is this. While everybody is talking about Byron Leftwich, and while everybody is seeing this and they're seeing Byron Leftwich, Nobody's talking about the other two players in this image. Few people outside of Marshall fans even know who they are. But in that moment, when the Marshall fans in the stadium were going absolutely crazy over this scene, they weren't just cheering for Byron Leftwich. They were taking pride in these two offensive linemen. They were taking pride in Steve Shulo and Steve Peretta, who were lifting up their teammate in this time of need. Not just for him, but for the good of the whole. For the good of the whole team. This moment truly embodied the meaning behind the chant that would become the name of the movie that maybe many of you have seen called We Are Marshall. And that's right, Dalton, you've got to write Marshall on your fill in the blank there. I know how you're a big Marshall fan, so. I did that just for you, buddy. I want us to hold on uh, to this image for a little while. I want us to think about this image for a little while as we enter into our passage for this morning. We find our story in Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 16, but before we get into it, we need to kind of set the scene. We need to kind of get some of the context. The Israelites have recently escaped slavery in Egypt after they've been living there for 430 years. In Exodus chapter 14, we read of how God would bring the Israelites out of Egypt by bringing them through the Red Sea and defeating the, the Egyptian army in that same sea. The people of Israel celebrate this victory in song in chapter 15. And they're hardly out of Egypt when we read in Exodus 15 and verse 22 through 24 that then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea. And they went into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness, and they found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? They've just escaped Egypt, and they go three days in, into the wilderness of Shur, and they begin to grumble because now they find they have no water. But if you read on, you'll find that God provides water for them there. Chapter 16 opens, and we read in, in verse uh, we, we read in verse 1, it says, They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. It says, And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. The people go a little bit further, and they find themselves hungry now, without any food. And so the theme continues. They begin to grumble again. However, if you read further, you'll find that God provides by raining down manna from heaven. And then comes chapter 17. And chapter 17 opens by saying, All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord. And they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? 
Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? The people go on the move again, and they come to Rephidim, where once again they're faced with a problem. Here at Rephidim, there's no water for them to drink, and so they begin once again to grumble towards Moses and towards Aaron and even towards God. But once again, God will provide by having Moses strike the rock and providing water from it. This is the theme of, of the Israelites. They've been traveling for several days now in the wilderness. They've just come out of a lifetime of oppression in Egypt. They believe that they've finally gotten everything back together, that things have finally gotten better for them. But they're quickly faced with extreme thirst and, and fear of dehydration. And God provides. And though that problem is fixed, it's followed quickly with hunger and fear of starvation. And once again, God provides. But once again, trouble sets in. And they're faced with another bout of thirst and dehydration. And in this moment, they've come out of Egypt. They've come out of their slavery. They've escaped the, the oncoming army. They've now faced thirst, and they've overcome it. They've now faced hunger, and it's been taken care of. They've faced thirst again, and it's been taken care of. So they, they've had years of slavery and oppression, followed by thirst, followed by hunger, followed by thirst. And you've got to be thinking that as they get to this moment, and their thirst is finally taken care of here at Rafidim, that they're probably thinking, I'm glad that's over. Because I just don't know how much more of this I can take. They're probably ready to just sit back and just rest for a moment here at Rafidim. How many of you can relate to this? How many of us can relate to this feeling of, you know what, I'm just glad it's over. And I just need a break. I just need to be able to rest for a moment. We can, we can relate to this feeling. God, I just don't know how much more I can take, and I really could just use some rest. And the thought barely enters into their minds before they begin being attacked by a pneumatic group called the Amalekites. And I'm guessing that the Israelites are beginning to wonder if they're ever going to catch a break if things are ever going to just get better for them, if it will ever seem like life isn't just throwing everything at them. I'll go ahead and tell you now that God will get them through this situation as well. And it won't be the last time that they face any problems. And there's still going to be difficult days ahead in the life of the Israelites. But there's something about this story, something about the way that God gets them through this, that I believe would be a lesson for how they can get through their future difficulties. And a lesson for us for how we can get through our future difficulties. Something I believe we can learn from it as well. And so we find this story in Exodus chapter 17. If you open up your Bibles, I'm going to read it from there. Exodus chapter 17, beginning at verse 8, we read this story. It says, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And so Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. And so Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and they put it under him, and he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord, 
The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. We read this story and we, we see how the Amalekites are, are coming in and, and they're, they're attacking this nation of Israel. Israel has faced all that they can handle and, and yet more is coming. And so Moses tells Joshua to get the, the army ready and to go out and to fight Amalek. And, and that tomorrow he and, and Aaron and her are going to go up on top of, of this mountain. While the Israelites and the Amalekites do battle. And Moses goes up on top of the mountain and he takes the staff of God with him. And he holds it up in the air. And as the army sees this. As they see Moses with his hands and the staff of God raised in the air, they prevail, and they're beating the Amalekite army. And this goes on a while, and it's going pretty well, but the problem is Moses' arms get tired. Moses grows weary, and he has to put his arms down. And when his arms go down, and the Israelite army can no longer see Moses, no longer get this, this visual aid of, of God's power, in front of them, they begin to, to weaken, and the Amalekites begin to prevail. But not to be discouraged and not to be defeated, Aaron and Hur come along, and they roll a stone over, and they set Moses on the stone, and one of them gets on one side, the other on the other, and they lift up Moses' arms. They lift up Moses' hands. So that the army can see their leader. And so that the army can see this staff of God. And they hold his hands high so that the Israelites can prevail. And they win this battle under their leadership and under this banner of God. And there's two things, two lessons that I want us to, to see so far from this. We see the, the first one in verse 9. Where Moses says, tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill, he says, with the staff of God in my hand. It's that same staff that Moses uh, used while he was sent into, uh, into Egypt to send these plagues on Egypt. It's the same staff that God would, would lift, would, had Moses lift over the sea to part the waters. You'll remember this staff from, from Exodus chapter 4 and, and verse 1. When Moses is being told to, to go and do these things, and he, he says to God, he says, you know, I, they're not going to believe me, and they're not going to listen to my voice. And God looks at him and says, what's that in your hand? And Moses says, well, it's a staff. And God says, well, use that. It's the same staff that God will use through Moses to do all of these great things. And it's a reminder in this moment that God will do great things to carry us through when we commit what we have to him. The second lesson we see in verses 14 through 16, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar, and he called the name of, the Lord, uh, the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. We have this second great lesson that Yahweh, that God, Yahweh, the, the God who is, the God who always has been, the God who always will be, is our banner, is what we fight under, is our victory, and victory comes only through him. These are two great lessons, and they are absolutely true, and they're vital to us, to, to work for us in working through our times of difficulty they're vital for us to be able to see that, that what we have can be given to God and committed to God, and God will do great things through it. And it's a great lesson for us to realize that in our times of difficulty, in our times of struggle, that God is still with us, that God is still our banner, and that God is still our victory. But there's one more thing. One more thing that God wanted them to see so much that he displayed it on top of the mountain says in Exodus 17, verses 10 through 12. So Joshua did as Moses told him, and he fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, 
Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and they put it under him, and, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. While the Israelites are in battle, they could look up on the mountain, and they could see Moses. They could see the staff. They could see their leader and this prophet of God. They could see his hands held high with that staff of God would have become this great symbol of God's power towering above them. And when it's easy to see those things, it's easy for us to put our faith in God. But then sometimes they couldn't. Sometimes they couldn't see their leader. And sometimes they couldn't see the staff. Because Moses' arms would grow weary. And when they lost sight of their leader, when they lost sight of the symbol of power that Moses would hold in his hands, not only did Moses grow weary, but the army would grow weary as well. But then something happened. Something that maybe they just weren't expecting. Suddenly, on the top of the mountain, while they're being defeated, and they're looking for hope, they could see Moses again. And they could see the staff of God again. And as they look closer, they can also see why. Because standing on each side of Moses are Aaron and Hur. And Aaron and Hur are holding up Moses' hands. Now here's the point. Three great lessons. In the staff, we continue to see that God will do great things in us and through us when we commit what we have to him. We see that Yahweh is, is God alone and that victory comes only through him. But there's this third great lesson. Sometimes when it rains, it pours. And we understand that. And this is what the Israelites are understanding also. Slavery, oppression, injustice, thirst, hunger, thirst, war. It just seems like they can't catch a break. And they're realizing that sometimes when it rains, it pours, and even the strongest grow weak. And what they realize is this. What we all need is for someone to come along and lift up our hands. When the Israelites look up on the mountain, they see their leader and they see the power of God. But they also see some of their own up there, standing up there, holding up the hands of Moses. Two of their own that just aren't as well known as Moses, that sometimes we forget about. We, we remember Aaron, but it's not very often that we talk about her. And yet, in this moment, what they are doing is just as important, just as powerful. And they're holding up the hands of Moses. And maybe they're reminded that even in our most difficult times, we need each other. Even in our most difficult times, we need to be able to lift up each other's hands. We need to be able to support one another. Paul says it this way in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. I love these words that he uses here. This word encourage, it's a word of proximity. It's a word that means getting close to somebody for the purpose of strengthening their heart. As a matter of fact, you'll notice right in the middle of this word core, it's a Latin word that simply means heart. And this word encourage is all about the heart. It's about, like I said, it's about getting close to somebody for the purpose of strengthening them and strengthening their heart. And this word build, to build up, it's the Greek word oikodomeo. It's a word that means to build a house, to erect a building, to add value, to give strength, to give structural support. And Paul says this to the church at Thessalonica. He says, I want you to get so close to people that you're able to get close to their heart. And I want you to be there for one another for the purpose of strengthening your hearts. And I want you to add value to each other. I want you to build one another up. I want you to give each other strength. 
I want you to be the structure that holds each other up so that even in our most broken times, we have the support that we need. And so he says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. He could have just as easily said, therefore, I want you to hold up one another's hands. And I want you to support one another. Do you know somebody like that? Do you know somebody who's really good at that? Yeah, it's not always the, the most glamorous job. It, it's what Steve Shulo and, and Steve Peretta were doing to Byron Leftwich. It's what Aaron and her were doing to Moses. Do you know one of those people that's just so good at lifting up your hands? So good at this gift of encouragement. They just have that ability to lift you up when you can't do it on your own. Yeah, I've told, this, told you this story before about, um, about this woman that... You know, the congregation that I grew up in, this was this elderly woman. She was a, a small lady. Her name was Jean Sauer. And she's one of the most wonderful people that, that I've ever met. And I remember even from a young age, getting up and, and reading scripture and, and getting up and, and uh, saying a prayer, you eventually leading a song or, or preaching a sermon. And it didn't matter what it was after every time she would come and, and she would give me this, this big old hug. Like I said, she was a pretty small woman. I was pretty tall from an early age, and so she'd have to come up and she'd almost like just lift up my arms and put herself in there. And she'd put her head right up against my chest. And I mean, I could have read the wrong scripture and got every word wrong, and she still would have told me how great it was. And she'd put her, her head right there against my chest. She'd lift up my hands, put her head close to my heart, and she would encourage me. And I think that that's just exactly what Paul is talking about. That we need people like that, who will in fact lift up our hands and who will put their heads close to our heart to get close to our heart and to strengthen us, to, to lift us up. We need people like that. And we know people like that. And as we think about this, there's two questions that I want us to think about as we close. Two questions that I want us to ask. First is this, who is raising your hands? Who is it that's raising your hands? You see, we all need somebody to raise our hands. And I want you to just take a moment and think about that. In your life, when you've faced the difficult times, when you've needed the encouragement, when you haven't been able to stand on your own, and you needed somebody to come in and, and to be your strength for you, who was that? Who is that? We all need someone to raise our hands. Because occasionally we find ourselves in the storm where when it rains, it pours. And we need that person to raise our hands for us. I want you to think about that person for a moment. I want you to take a moment this week and to thank that person. I want you to take a moment and to pray for that person. Because these people are rare. And these people are treasures. And we don't need to take these people for granted. And so ask yourself this question, who is it that's raising up your hands? But then I also want to ask us this question, whose hands are we raising? You see, sometimes we're Moses, and we need our hands raised. But sometimes it's not us that's going through the difficult times. Sometimes we actually do have a bit of our own strength. Sometimes we are actually able to hold ourselves up. But while we're experiencing that, we also know that there are people around us who can't. We know that there are people who are going through storms. We know that there are people who are growing weary. And while sometimes we're Moses and we need people to lift up our hands, sometimes we're also called to be Aaron. Sometimes we're also called to be her. And we're called to raise up somebody else's hand. So let's ask ourselves that question. Who are we getting close to for the purpose of strengthening their heart? Who are you building up? Whose life are you adding value to? Who are you giving strength to? Because I believe that yes, I believe God will work through us and, and yes, I believe that God will work in us. Yes, I believe that, that God is, is in control and that it's God who will give us the victory. But I also believe that God calls us to step into those moments. 
to be part of, of the plan. And God calls us to lift up one another's hands. God calls us to strengthen one another's hearts. God calls us to give each other strength and encouragement and stability when each other are weary. And so to think about those two things. Who is it that's raising your hands? Like I said, those people are gold. Don't take them for granted. Thank them. Pray for them. Then also ask yourself, whose hands can I be raising? And let's build, let's build each other up and encourage one another. Before we offer an invitation, I want to close one more time with a prayer. Father, we thank you for the way that you lift us up. And Father, we are mindful in this moment, as many of us have in our minds people in our lives, many of us have people in our minds that are sitting in this room with us, maybe even sitting in the seat beside us. Father, we are grateful that in the times when we have grown weary, that you've put the errands and the hers in our life. We are grateful that you have put those people in our life who have come along, who have picked us up, who have lifted up our hands, who have put their heads to our hearts, and who's given us the strength that we need in those times of difficulty. Father, I thank you for my sister Jean and for the way that she's always lifted me up. I thank you for just that incredible person that she was. Father, I th I'm thankful for the people in here who have done just exactly that same thing, who have at times in, in difficulties who have lifted my hands and who have lifted the hands of, of the people around them. I'm thankful for the way that you've created us to be family, to give strength to one another. Father, I'm thankful that even in the storms, when it seems like we just can't catch a break, that you've given us each other. And Father, we pray that we will commit everything to you. We pray that we will trust you for the victory. But we pray that we will build one another up as we work towards that victory. Father, thank you once again for family. Thank you once again for these people. And as I know that you, Father, know what's in the hearts and the minds of each person listening, and you see that picture also that these people are picturing of those people who have lifted up their hands, Father, thank you for those people. Father, help us now to also be people who are willing to lift up one another's hands. We love you so much, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning as we close, we want to offer once again the invitation, the invitation to put Christ on in baptism, who is the original one to put up his hands so that we all could be encouraged, so that we all could be strengthened, so that we all could find victory. And so we invite you to put your hope and your trust in him by putting him on in baptism. If you need prayers, whatever it might be, we're going to have an elder standing in the back, or, or you can come forward. Whatever your need might be, please make it known now as together we stand and say. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all Yeah.
Take those as, as we um, look here. Um, we're going to pause in between each one just to give us time to reflect. Last week, uh, Stephen brought us another lesson on how through Christ, God provided through feeding the 5,000. He made a lot out of a little. And then he continued on and showed us how when the apostles were out on the, on the sea, how they were afraid, but then Christ comforted them and brought us the, made the point of, you know, that things that are above us are under Christ's feet. And then John, as he, he can do, brings us another spiritual lesson from this. And that's what I, what I want us to look at uh, as we take the... Before we take the Lord's Supper. In John chapter 6, verses 33 through 35. For the bread of God is, is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Then in verse 51, he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the love that he had for us, we thank you for the grace, the mercy, the salvation that we have because of his sacrifice on the cross. Now we pray that you'll be with us as we take this bread that represents his body that he gave on the cross for our sins. We pray that as we take it, we will reflect on the meaning that this has for us and what we've received because of it. It's his name we pray. Amen. John continues on in verses 53 through 58. He said, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise, raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks of my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread that the fathers ate and died. 
Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we again come to you, thanking you for Christ and his sacrifice for our sins. We pray that you will be with us as we take this cup that represents Christ's blood that he so freely gave on the cross for our sins. And we, again, we ask that you will be with us and strengthen us and, and to bring us closer to Christ as we take this. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 23, um, Matthew writes, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Here you had the Jews who thought they were doing the right thing by tithing, but their heart wasn't in the right place. The tithing that, that God wants, he wants, he wants us, the tithe to bring justice, wants to change our hearts so that we can bring Christ to the world. And Christ means bringing justice, love, all those things that, that Christ gives us. We looked at you know, how through Christ, a lot can be brought from a little. Our giving may seem like a little bit, but through Christ, there's a lot that comes to, from it. We have missionaries all over the world. We've started orphanages in um, India. We've, we've started schools in Africa. We brought churches into Mexico. We've brought help to many people in our area. We've brought help to each other. All from just our little contribution has done a lot. And God doesn't need our money. He does it for us. He does it to change us and our spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us. We thank you for providing for us. We thank you for Jesus. And we pray that as we give, your, world will, your word will be brought to the world. We pray that justice will happen through our, our giving. Pray that we will change as we give as well and as we help others. Pray that as we do this, we do so cheerfully and with a heart that you would like for us to do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <coughs> I'd like to welcome everybody back this evening for a period of uh, devotional time and then some fellowship time as we uh, watch the football game and enjoy some good food here, hopefully. Uh, if we're going to close with uh, our theme verse of the year, which also happens to be a song. Um, I know the Wednesday night kids should know this, so I'll sing out loud. Uh, we're going to do this all in unison, no 
rounds, no men, women, that kind of thing. Everybody just sing it all together. We'll sing through a couple times. <clears throat> After this, we'll be led in closing word prayer. <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice. And again I say rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice, 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 and again I say rejoice. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer, giving you thanks for another day that you bless us with. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to gather here this morning and sing songs of praise and hear another lesson from your word. Father, we pray as we leave here today that we'll be of better service to you and better service to others. Father, we have so many in our number that are dealing with sickness and some that have deaths and families. And Father, we just pray that you bless them and comfort them as only you can. Help us in the things that are right and defeat us in the things that are wrong. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, if you remember the January 5th Sunday, uh, we uh, received $9,534 on the 5th Sunday. We divided that amongst five uh, mission efforts that we support that have expressed some extra needs, and we've sent that uh, one-fifth of that to those. Uh, one of those has been Franzic in New York State. Another is to uh, Dr. Moses Akinudo in Nigeria. Another is to uh, Gary and Michelle Ford in Thailand. Uh, we also sent some to uh, Daniel Gaines, who works in Tanzania. And then the last of the five was uh, to uh, Brother Mario Banuelos in the Baja and Zapata. And so thank you for your gift. And we've received thank yous back from all of those. And we, we know that that uh, is going to be used in, in several really good ways. Uh, another uh, announcement with regard to uh, giving, uh, we have the tornado fund that was given and we're looking at uh, needs now and talking to people that have needs, but to can continue to keep that on your mind and heart. If you know of someone who has a specific need, uh, please see Brent Gibson or myself uh, or one of the other elders. Uh, or Melinda, and um, let us know, and we'll, we'll reach out to them and see if we can help them uh, in some way. We have funds to do that, and we want to be uh, responsible and use those funds in a really good way. The last announcement is with regard to the Baja Mission trip in June, June the 11th through the 18th. Uh, there are applications uh, out on the, uh, the tables in the foyer, and if you are interested in going, please see me. We need to begin to get our plans together. We'll have a meeting coming up soon. Uh, Brother Wayne Brewer uh, will be uh, bringing a group also from Arkansas. Uh, and so we'll join together and meet in uh, the Baja in June. So I encourage you to look at that, consider that, uh, and then let's, uh, let's talk some about that trip. I'll be out there in a couple of weeks for a men's encouragement trip, and we'll know more about uh, their needs and things that we'll be doing in June when I get back.
before we dismiss today, we want to recognize the birthdays and anniversaries of the congregation for the week. Uh, do you have one anniversary? Uh, Jeff and Sonia Byron are celebrating every anniversary this week. If you see Jeff and Sonia, please wish Jeff a happy anniversary. Uh, do you have several birthdays uh, that are celebrating this week? And if I call your name, would you please stand? Alex Harris. Howard Miller. Ellie Bennett. We have Cohen Caravive, also known as Little Max. Is he here? There he is. And Simon Folger. I saw Simon. There he is. Shirley Bowser. Benny Hinnon. And Ben Brown. Any birthdays we missed last week that we don't like this week? All right. David, start us off. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday and God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Dismiss the class. Yeah. <laughs>